Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin worship in the Lord this morning for his compassion. I'm going to read Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 23. Please hear the words of the Lord. Yahweh's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Father, we come before you praising you for your compassions. They never fail because your power and plans are ultimate. Like the dew, they are fresh every morning, and they will never stop because you are eternal and faithful. Father, help us trust this. Help us believe this. When we're experiencing the consequences of our own sin, when we're sinned against, when we suffer loss, or when our patience seems to run out, when our compassion does fail, and when we aren't faithful. Father, help us remember your faithfulness, your compassion, your forgiveness. And may we be refreshed and encouraged to show others the same compassion you have shown us. We ask this in the name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the free gift of salvation is also forever. That brings a peace and a rest that we just can't find in anyone else or anything else but Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and begin singing about that today. Here we go. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer fuller be oh like that followest all my way I yield my flickering torch to Nothing in all these 
reading this morning comes from Psalm 150. This is the final psalm in, in the book, and it's a fitting conclusion uh, to the book of Psalms. It's very straightforward and, and easy to understand. The main point is found in every single line of the psalm. We are called to praise the Lord. Uh, everything that has breath is called to praise the Lord. This is why we exist, and uh, this is why we are here this morning. So Hear now the word of the Lord from Psalm 150. Praise Yahweh. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, indeed gathered here this morning to praise your great name and to praise you for your mighty deeds. Lord, you alone are worthy of all praise. And as we reflect on how worthy you are, we are reminded of our own unworthiness. Father, we are sinful and prideful creatures, and at times we lose sight of your greatness, and we seek to praise ourselves, and we praise uh, the creation over the Creator, and we become consumed with temporary things in our own lives and our own comfort. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us and help us not to lose sight of your greatness and just how worthy of praise you are. May our eyes be fixed upon you. May we truly praise you uh, with all of our hearts just as we were created to do. So Father, we thank you for saving us and we do praise you for who you are and for all that you've done. Help us now to respond to the preaching of your word with humility and faith. Lord, give us listening hearts so that we might be changed by the power of your word. Teach us wisdom as we learn what it means to fear you. 
And may our praise to you be holy and pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, with next week being Easter, we can certainly anticipate celebrating the glorious resurrection of our Savior. But this week as well, we remember what led up to that and his great love, which moved our Savior to stand in our place once and for all. Let's stand together, please. Oh, come and mourn with me a while. Oh, come ye to the Savior's side. Oh, come together, let us mourn. Jesus our Lord was crucified. Seven times he spake, seven words of love, and all three hours his silence cried for mercy on the souls of men. Jesus our Lord was crucified. Oh, love of God, oh, sin of man, in this dread act his strength was tried, and victory remained with love. Jesus our Lord was crucified. Oh, break, oh, break, hard, hard of mine, thy weak self-love and guilt.
Good morning. Let's take our Bibles together. We are in Proverbs chapter 5. <clears throat> we are, as a church, studying together the book of Proverbs, and we're learning what it means to walk with the Lord in fear and wisdom. And that's not a fear of being afraid necessarily of God, but of to, learning to walk with Him in, in reverence and worship and how uh, His ministry to us through Christ, how His rescuing of us and His redeeming us that we've been singing about celebrating today changes everything for us and impacts our lives in every aspect of our lives. And we're going to see how that's begin, uh, going to start to take on new shape and form as we uh, get further along in our study. I want to read all of chapter 5. I'm not going to... Uh, we're not going to be able to study all of it together today. We're going to look at this over the next number of weeks. We're going to take a break next week because I don't want to scandalize our Easter visitors with this chapter, as you will see. Uh, but we will focus on the Lord's resurrection next week. But this is a, a wonderful chapter. It's God's word to us. And I want to read it in its entirety and, and then we'll look at it, uh, begin to look at it this morning. Proverbs chapter 5. Hear the word of the Lord. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not ponder the paths of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. And strangers will be filled with your strength and your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien. And you groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I have hated instruction and in my heart, it spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. 
Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner? For the wages of a man are before the eyes, the ways of a man are before the eyes of Yahweh, and he watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. I hope you're awake by now. This is a, a provocative chapter. It's interesting. It's extremely relevant to our church on, on many levels. Uh, these chapters, chapters 5 through 7, are what I heard one uh, British preacher call the juicy bits of, of Proverbs. And so here we are at the juicy bits uh, of Proverbs. And Proverbs 5 through 7 are three chapters really on the purity and godliness of uh, that is needed in our inner relatedness to one another in a variety of relationships, married or not. This is a, a chapter that is sadly sometimes neglected, passed over, not read, forgotten, just entirely ignored at times. Uh, Dwayne Garrett has a, an insightful comment here at this point. He says this, he says this, uh, the Bible does not hide from or obscure the power of, tem of the temptation to elicit sex. In language that is refreshingly clear and direct without self-indulging and, titil and titillation, the text warns the reader of the debacle that awaits him should he succumb in this area and at the same time promise profound sexual joy to those whose hearts are chaste and loving. If the church is to do its duty, it must be no less clear in its teachings. To assume, to assume that nice Christian young people do not struggle in these areas or to speak only in whispers and innuendo on grounds that they are inappropriate for the Christian pulpit is no less than gross neglect of the duty of the church's part. Whether one is dealing with the ritual prostitution of the fertility cult in the Old Testament or the ordinary prostitute on the street or in the magazine or on the internet or the simple lure of extramarital sex, the temptations and dangers are the same." End quote. How did we get here? Well, you have to go back to the beginning, right? Uh, you go back to Genesis 2 and you see God's design for marriage and you see almost immediately that it starts to run amok. And, and mankind starts to do his own thing, to go his own way, and for all sorts of reasons. Now, I want to return to this question of, of why is it amongst Christians that topics like this are often ignored, not taught, Skipped over, neglected entirely. How did we get to that point? Well, I want to be careful to also say that over the last 2,000 years, there have been numerous errant and unhelpful teachings, not just out there in the world, but from Christians. That there have been preachers who have taught some really dumb things, to paraphrase Proverbs. Sometimes downplaying what it says, or maybe even overstating what it says. If you're new to Christianity or maybe hovering around the edges of it, you may have heard that Christians who love Jesus and their Bibles are, in a word, repressed. Let me just invite you to maybe walk by our children's ministry at some point, and you'll see that's not entirely the case. Nevertheless, uh, there have been some really terrible teachings at the hands of Christian preachers over the last 2,000 years. There have really been some bizarre things regarding marriage and what it means and how God intended it to work. Preachers have said some really dumb things about some really good things. What the Bible calls good, it is often maligned and twisted and confused in all sorts of ways. And I know what you're thinking. I want some examples, so I'm here to give you some. Chrysostom, who was an early church teacher, had a lot of good things to say, was a faithful preacher in many ways, uh, he, on occasion, said some really dumb things as well. And he said that Adam and Eve could not have had marital relations before the fall. He has, gives no reason for that, just conjecture. Origen, who was a false teacher in the early church, he believed that if sin had not entered the world, the human race would have been propagated by some mysterious angelic manner rather than through normal reproduction. Bishop Gregory of Nyssa, he claimed that Adam and Eve had originally been created without sexual desire and that if the fall had not occurred, the human race would have produced itself by some harmless mode of vegetation. Thankfully, none of these and many more are right. Uh, th these all miss the point. 
some of my own family comes from a Roman Catholic background, and I'm not here to just bag on the Roman Catholics, but part of that is due to that tradition as well. The Roman Catholic Church believes in order to protect Mary's nature, which doesn't need to be protected, by the way, but in order to protect her nature and the ministry, she must have, uh, have been immaculately conceived, that is, without original sin. She never sinned. Not only that, some believe she never had any other children after Jesus, even though the text says something very different. It's also falsely taught that those who lead in the Roman Catholic Church must vow to celibacy, since that, they say, is the highest degree of perfection in ministry. I'm really thankful to be a Protestant pastor. Is errant, unhelpful teachings that have infiltrated the church and the traditions over the last 2,000 years. Other aspects of how we got here, there's also errant cultural expressions that ultimately seek to dethrone God. It's not only the things in here, we have to recognize as we're talking about marriage and relationships, we have to realize that there are also threats and there are challenges to that outside of the body of Christ. Ever since Genesis 2.24, humanity has thought that it could improve on or change or adjust God's design for marriage. What is Genesis 2.24? It's really the, the headwaters of God's design for marriage. Genesis 2.24 says that uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That was never overturned. That is not only for Adam and Eve, but that was to be upheld by all peoples in all places. That was God's design for the stability of the family and for the propagation of humanity and, as we're going to see in chapter 5, even the enjoyment of husband and wife. And yet, nevertheless, and the Bible doesn't hide these details, almost immediately after that is put in place by God himself, man starts to rebel against that. And we have patriarchs in the Old Testament trying to pass off their wives as sisters, not once but twice. We have others taking on multiple wives, even though Genesis 2.24 again says, one man, one woman, together, one flesh. All of that is there. And there are endless challenges that go on and on all throughout history. And the place of God's design for marriage is not just a, a patchwork system by which we can move the parts around the way we choose. What's really happening here is a replacement ruling philosophy that really springs from the heart. And it says something like this, I will do what will make me happy. That becomes really the ruling desire. Even one atheist secular critic said that the God of our day is the self. Carl Truman, who is faithful believer, he is correct. He says this, he says, here's what's going on today. Expressive individualism is the default setting for understanding ourselves in the 21st century. Expressive individualism. In other words, the individual, the self is king or queen. They are the ones who make the rules. They are the ones who set the parameters. They are the ones who say, I will do what I want to do and no one can say anything about it. Truman explains that what this means today is that, quote, the individual's inner identity is defined by sexual desire. And when this is the case, then he or she must be allowed to act out on that desire in order to be a so-called authentic person. He's not defending that. He's saying this is the ruling philosophy of our day. And, and this is true. We see this everywhere. Jesus himself, again, upheld the design of Genesis 2.24. He once got into a debate. It was really a lopsided debate, but in Matthew 19, because he wins, in, in Matthew 19, uh, when he's questioned about issues of divorce and remarriage, he upholds Genesis 2.24. When the Apostle Paul is teaching on marriage and the family, he is quoting in Ephesians from Genesis 2.24. There's all of those kinds of things. There's the errant assessment of leaders in the church. There's the errant cultural expressions that seek to dethrone God. There's also, and here's probably the most, uh, sometimes the hardest to see in all of this. It, it, it could be the errant assessment of the human heart. In other words, we don't see things as we should when left to ourselves. You, you do understand this, right? That there is always another lens 
at play here from a biblical standpoint. In other words, if you are a scientist and you go out in the yard and you look through binoculars or through a telescope and you look up at the skies and you, and you want to make observations about that, or you go into a, a lab and you look through uh, something else and you're, and you're seeing something in, in a microcosmic way, not just the cosmic way, what you often don't understand is that there is another lens by which you're looking through, and that is the lens of human fallenness and experience. So that we don't see things as we should. That, that, that's, that's actually a bug in the system. That's not a feature. That is a result of the fall of Genesis 3. So we don't assess things rightly. We don't look at relationships rightly. We don't look at marriage rightly. We don't, we don't think about love in the right ways. We don't think about it in the way God has told us to think about it. We don't assess things rightly, whether we're looking at a telescope or through a microscope, much less looking at relationships so we have the errant assessment of the human heart. And the only thing that reveals that and redeems that is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we are given new eyes to see. We come back to scripture and we say, what has God said about this? Has he said anything? One area where Christians, many Christians are wrong in this kind of assessment is they think that the moral morass of radical feminism or internet and technological porn or the onslaught of pop culture, those are the reasons, those things out there, those are the reasons why things are so crazy in here at times. But here's the problem with that. If we're not assessing the human heart, if one believes that all the threats are external, let's say out there, then that will lead many believers to pursue changes that are only external and out there. You will foolishly believe things like American morality turns on the, de, the whims and the decisions of a Supreme Court. It doesn't. Uh, you, you would be mistaken if you believe that. You will mistake at times the, the mission of God to change hearts for the misguided venture of trying to change the culture. That's a faulty mission. Some Christians have believed that. There's a, a, a rebirth and an onslaught for reasons I don't fully understand. It was, it was dumb the first time. But Christian nationalism that confuses uh, the mission of the church for some other mission, which is, other, which is really worldly at heart, and not biblical. If you think that the problems are out there, they're culturally related, they're in the mechanisms and the, and the structures of society and those kinds of things, then that's going to be your main focus. But what Solomon is driving at here and what God's word is constantly pointing to is we must address the level of the human heart. Why do I believe the things that I believe? Why am I following my desires, good, bad, or seemingly indifferent? In the context of Proverbs chapter 5, it comes at a point that, for good reason, Solomon has already established a biblical foundation for knowing and fearing God. As we always say, chapter 5 or any chapter comes at a particular point for a particular reason. And what has Solomon been doing? In the first four chapters, laying a very careful foundation for how we think, how we worship, how we move, how we assess everything in God's creation and even in our own hearts. And it should not be controversial. By the time we get to Proverbs chapter 5, at this point, to say some very definitive things, because we are resting on not our wisdom, but God's wisdom. It should not be controversial to say that, which should be obvious, that men and women are different. Did you know that? <laughs> men and women are different. If, if you didn't know that, you just need to live a little, a little longer. It will become very clear. And that's not a bug in the system. That's actually a feature of the system. That is how God has created man and woman, male and female. And there are complementary designs to that. There are complementary roles to that. There are all kinds of aspects that play out in the home and the church and so on. It shouldn't be controversial just to say this is what God says. It should not be scandalous for those who read the Bible to understand that God's design for marriage is one man, one woman, and holy and pure desire for each other. Just read the Bible. Don't look at the culture. Read the Bible. Anytime someone starts to play with those parameters, it doesn't go well. Every single time. Now, not everybody here is married. You may be single. Uh, you may be single again, widowed. 
If, if you're single, don't, don't, don't hear this as chastisement for being single. That, that's, that's not a problem. This is God's word. Chapter 5 is God's word for you as well. He wants us to understand why we desire the things we desire. He wants our minds and our hearts to be shaped by this same truth. And still it addresses some things that we've dealt with over the years here. It could be also that this serves as a warning, not only an encouragement, but a warning to some who might sinfully idolize things like marriage. It's actually possible to want something that is good and given by God, designed by God, and want it in an idolatrous way. That can happen with food. That can happen with drink. That can happen with sex. That can happen with money. That can happen in all sorts of things that are meant to be blessings and they can be turned into idolatry. It's a warning in that sense. Even if you have no desire at this point to be married, that's probably all of you seven-year-olds. You might be thinking, I don't really want to get married right now. Well, there is still truth here to help you, and here's what it's doing. Even if that's not your desire, it's, it's here to help you protect your own heart, to fortify your own heart in truth, but also ultimately to even protect the other relationships of those in the body of Christ, the other marriages and the other relationships that are going on. This is also for some who are in relationships. I, I love this season of our church where we're seeing a lot of folks, a lot of young people getting married we're just in a season of that with seemingly one wedding after another lately. This is wonderful truth as you're starting out. This is a, not only a warning for those who are entering into that, but this is great instruction and teaching here in chapter 5, 6, and 7 that is helping us form our way as we are beginning marriage or as maybe a refresher for others as you're looking back on certain things in your life. As we've been noting all along the way in our study, we really have two choices in Proverbs. Not, not to bottom line things, but Solomon and God's word bottom lines it at this point. You have two choices. There are two different paths. Will I choose the path of foolishness or the path of wisdom? Will I choose the path of foolishness or the path of wisdom? The path of wisdom, he says, is blessing, it's goodness, it's joy, it's God's approval. Or will I go my own way? What is the path of foolishness? It's destruction. It's pain. It's anguish. It's, let's call it what it is. It's rebellion. Well, standing in the midst of all of this kind of confusion and crying out to us like a voice of wisdom is God's word. And here as we now draw our attention to chapter 5, and we're going to look at the first six verses here. If you kind of just look over chapter 5, you'll notice, and maybe it's broken up this way in your Bibles and your translations, that there's really a, a four-part structure to this. There's four paragraphs or, or stanzas. And, and the outline that I'm going to give you here is really one that I was taught by numerous mentors to me and don't feel like I can improve on it in any way. But there are four stanzas in chapter 5, and each one points to a vital consideration that, that each of us must understand. Solomon is saying, you must know this. Again, think of the context. This is Solomon talking. And he knew this from the Word of God, but he also knew the pain of this from not obeying and following the Word of God. Let me give you just Proverbs 5 at a glance. First of all, we see in, in verses 1 through 6 the dangers of the adulteress. We're going to look at that this morning. Secondly, we're going to look at the debt of infidelity in verses 7 through 14. And here in that section is, the, is really the motivation for steering as far away as you can from certain disaster. The, there are devastating consequences to sexual immorality. And we're going to see there that those who succumb to temptations will be fraught not only with spiritual suffering, but even possibly physical and financial suffering. It's not all bad news. It's not all negative. We're going to see number three in the third stanza, verses 15 through 20, the delights of marriage. Not all is negative here. Solomon enjoins the reader to consider the beauty of God's design by physical expression within the bounds of marriage and as God designed it. Marriage, as we're going to see here, it's not reduced to mere reproduction, but there is enjoyment in this. Fourthly, we'll see in verses 21 through 23, the discipline that is needed to break the bondage of such sin. A lot of times it seems that Christians are, are fighting uh, mammoth temptations and sin with really small weapons. 
with, with, with really inadequate understanding and teaching and instruction. It seems like some are trying to fight decadence with just more decadence. But we don't fight sin and temptation with something that is, that is, uh, that is really a thin veneer of a response. In fact, we don't respond to such overwhelming and weighty decadence and sin and temptation with things that we might call conservative values. You don't fight satanic decadence of this magnitude by wrapping yourself in the thin veneer of red, white, and blue. Biblical convictional worship of the one true God is our only hope. That's it. It's not a restoring of something in the structures of man. It's not turning America back. It's not wrapping yourself in this or that uh, cause or banner. It is returning in biblical convictional worship to the one true God who has shown himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who walked this earth, who died on the cross, who was raised for us, and is coming back for his church. Outside of him, there's no hope. Outside of him, that is the only hope for your marriage for your potential relationships, for your current relationships, how God wants you to think, how God wants you to respond. Breaking the bondage of sinful enslavement is only found in knowing God, dwelling on the reality of His supreme greatness. In verses 21 through 23, they, they, they look at each, these verses look back at us and, and they ask a question, have you considered the ways of Yahweh? Do you understand that He sees everything? Do you think we have him fooled? Do you think that our secret sins, our secret pursuits, those places, those corridors, those hotels, those internet sessions, do you think he doesn't see that? That's what he's going to talk about in that last stanza. Well, this morning we want to look at the first of these. It's the dangers of the adulteress. The dangers of the adulteress. Look back again at verse 1. Solomon says, My son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. This is largely a repeat of things that we've seen over and over again in the first four chapters. But we're reminded again that what follows here is not just some useful info for us to tuck in our pockets and say, that's interesting. If I ever come across that, I'll, I'll make consider it. Now, what we have here is not something that you can take or leave. This is biblical wisdom. And what we find is that sinful responses and approaches to marriage means that Christians have not been immune to deviations from God's design. Our church, over the years, just like any healthy church, has experienced all sorts of deviations from God's ideal for marriage. Christians have been misled, abused, neglected, scammed taken advantage of in all kinds of ways. Ways that even this chapter details, painfully so. But notice here, Solomon says four things in these first two verses that you want to just remember here. Again, we've seen all of this before. The first thing he says there is pay close attention. Pay close attention. You might think this is not for you. You might think marriage is a long way off in the future. You might even think uh, overly negative about this and think, well, it's too late for my marriage. That's not the case either. Pay close attention. You're going to see hope here. Secondly, he says, position your ear to listen well. Position your ears to listen well. You know what that means? It means to listen with the ear of obedience. I want to hear what God's word says and then I want to respond with obedience. I, I, I don't want to rebel. I don't want to push against God because that never goes well, right? Third thing he says there in his first two verses, hold fast to biblical discretion. What is this? This is really uh, another word for self-discipline. It's not only enough to, to hear and to hold fast and to think about these things and, and to even meditate on them, but actually to put it into practice. Self-discipline. We've talked a lot about this. This is not just a pull yourself up by the bootstraps, do it yourself kind of Christianity. This is a self-discipline that is wrought in the grace of God. God changes your heart. He sets you in a new place. He has redeemed you. He changes your nature. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He has given you everything you need to live your life in a way that is pleasing to Him if you're in Christ. And so the, the tall order, seemingly, of this chapter is really not a tall order from God's perspective. It's actually what God expects of His children. 
Hold fast to biblical discretion. Last thing he says there, let your lips reserve knowledge. Let your lips reserve knowledge. What does this mean? It refers to growing deeper and more intimate with the subject before us. Have you thought about these things? Surely you have. Have you meditated on these things about your own marriage and the relationships of others and our church? And how can we come alongside those that are struggling? How can we counsel and disciple? How can we encourage those who, who seem to be tripped up in, in all manner of ways? The bottom line he's saying here in these first two verses is that you and I need wisdom on these matters. Do you believe that? We do, don't we? Chapters exist like this exist as a warning for some before anything gets started. That's why this chapter is here. That's one reason why it's here. Before you go down the paths that are described here, this is a warning for you. Don't entertain it. Don't go down that road. Don't uh, pull up now. Don't run through that red light that he is uh, putting here before us. For others, it might be a call for repentance. You've already started traveling down some of these roads that are described here. But not only that, it's also a call for hope, a reminder of the hope of the gospel. Because in a church like this, this is true at all times, it always has been, there are any number of people who've been on the giving or receiving end of abuses, of mistreatments, of scandal, of scams. And you need hope. Again, there is no hope outside of Christ. I love the hope of the gospel on matters like this because we've seen this so many times. If you've been around Christianity long at all, you've seen this too, that God takes those who are used, those who are abused, those who are forgotten, those who are rejected, those who are misguided. And what does He do? He redeems them with the hope of the gospel. He gives us His Son, Jesus Christ. Man will disappoint us. A woman will disappoint us. Children will disappoint us. We will be endlessly disappointed in one another for any variety of reasons, and we'll never run out of reasons for that unless we recover the hope of the gospel. And then we see the hope that is there even in those relationships between husband and wife and friends and brothers and sisters in Christ and children. God loves to do that. He loves to redeem. That is the history of our Bibles. That is the history of Christianity and the nation of Israel. But that's what he's saying here in the first two verses. Look at verse 3. And now he gets into the meat of the issue here. He says, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. She's literally, some translations will say, she is a strange woman. Could be. Not necessarily how you might think of that. You've, we've all encountered, we've all been to Walmart encountered strange women, right? That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a, an alien and a foreigner. And, and even then, not what you might think about an alien or foreigner. Here we're in Huntsville. You might think alien up there, or you might think alien across the border. That's not what he's talking about here. By alien and foreigner, he's actually reaching into his own background and what the Lord warned him of, and that is if you turn from the Genesis 2.24 design and you turn your heart to foreign women, he was warned about this and he did it a thousand times over. By turning to those foreign women, it wasn't just that they were of a different ethnicity and that that was the problem. That's not the warning. It was that they were not fears of God. They didn't know God. They didn't worship Him. And so he was warned that if you go with them, they will turn your heart away from the Lord. And guess what happened? God was exactly right. He, they turned his heart away from the Lord. He's still culpable. He's still responsible. But God warned him about that lips of an adulteress, this strange woman. He is under the influence of those who will turn their heart away from God. And he's starting, he's warning his sons, starting to go down the path of, this, of believing a lie here. Another way to think about this too is that this also refers to one who is outside of the marriage covenant. So she's, she's not only a stranger out there who might turn the heart as an unbeliever, but she's also a stranger to what is a bond and a covenant between a husband and a wife. So she should not be allowed in the midst of that covenant. There should be no break in that. It's very interesting as you read Genesis 
Adam knew his wife and the, and the intimacy and the language that is literally used in those texts or, or the intimate covenant language of knowledge. And then it says, and then Cain knew his wife. And then it jumps to Lamech and it says, Lamech took two wives. Very interesting. It departs from the covenant language. You, you might think, well, the Bible kind of turns a blind eye to uh, multiple wives and all those things. Not hardly. You've got to pay attention to the details. In fact, it's a, it, 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 it sets aside the covenant language that was used there and was to be upheld. And immediately he turns to his own sin. There's two songs in those opening chapters of a uh, number of chapters of Genesis. The first song in the Bible is Adam singing about the joys of his wife. It's poetry. The second song is Lamech singing a song bragging about a kid that he murdered. All of those things are going together. And you're seeing the more they get away from their covenant-keeping, covenant-loving God, the more they break the covenant, it, it just shows up in all areas of their life. I didn't mean to divert that far out. But here we are. The lips of the strange woman, the adulteress, the foreigner, the alien. It drips honey. Now, we've been introduced to her earlier. If you look back over at chapter 2, flip back over there for just a, a quick second. Chapter 2, verse 16, that uh, Solomon was saying, and he just, she just kind of makes a quick entrance there. Now, this is really, this chapter is the exposition of her, talking about what she's like. Back in chapter 2, verse 16, Solomon's writing that wisdom will deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words. That's how it starts. She leaves the companion of her youth, forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death, her tracks lead to dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. Two things are being recognized there in chapter 2 and then now here again back in chapter 5. It often starts with the allurement of words, doesn't it? Empty, hollow, vacuous words. Her lips, he says, he pictures it this way, they drip honey. The, the sweetest thing that you could taste in ancient Israel was honey. And we have our own concept of that. We have the glorious common grace of snicker bars and chocolate and things like that. But if you wanted something really sweet in ancient Israel, it was going to be made with honey. And in fact, in the Mediterranean region today, most desserts are still made with honey. Those are the sweet things. And, and he's saying that her words are like the sweetest thing to your taste. Not only that, her lips are, are smooth. Her speech is smoother than oil. The smoothest substance that one could handle in that day was newly pressed olive oil. It was used for everything. The, the viscosity was, was very thin and satiny and, and it would be used on weapons. It would be used in the kitchen. It would be used in medicinal ways. She's really smooth with her words. And, and just be aware of this, that this is often how it sits with us. This is often how it appears to us. It might come in a text. It, it might come in an email. It might come in a, a passing word at the office or a neighbor. It might even be a song. 19, here's your music history lesson for the day. 1930s blues pianist Roosevelt Sykes. His nickname was the Honey Dripper because his songs were smooth and sweet and he was always singing about all sorts of illicit uh, love stories and all sorts of things. When Robert Plant left Led Zeppelin, more history here, he started a band in 1981 called the Honey Drippers, an homage to Roosevelt Sykes. They wanted to sing about those old songs about forbidden love. Smooth talking lyrics is what is in verse 3. Now, let me address uh, something that's in the room, and that's boys and girls, because your lunch discussions are already going to be exciting today. Uh, I wish I was there. But kids, uh, what, what's going on in chapters like this? Here's, here's something that I want to make sure you understand. For kids, mom and dad, this is God's design. This is God's intention for marriage. That God intends for mom and dad to have a physical, emotional, and spiritual attraction to one another that belongs only to them. No one else is to share that. No one else is to invade that. No one else is to come between that. 
not even you, that you are a blessing to that household. The neighbors are maybe great neighbors. The friends at work are maybe great friends. And, but that is a special union that belongs only to mom and dad. That's essentially what he's talking about here. He's talking about that in a lot of other colorful ways and, and different things that moms and dads understand here. But you need to understand that we want to protect that. We want to pray for our parents. We want to encourage that where we see it. But notice how it comes. Those who might want to invade that kind of relationship, it often comes with words. But those words are really hollow. They're not real. Because look at the opposite side of this in verse 4. But in the end... She is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Notice Solomon doesn't say her words are bitter as wormwood. He now says it's really her nature. It's who she is. As bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. The, bitter of wor- the bitterness of wormwood was really legendary in Old Testament Israel. In, in Scripture, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's often used for calamity, for uh, cruelty, for sorrow, used in a variety of contexts. It's, it's never good. In fact, the plant was so repugnant that it was placed, they would take it and they would place it between woolen garments uh, in order to ward off moths and maggots. It was so bitter that the lowest life forms were repulsed by it. That's the picture that he's using here that her words and her life are actually like the bitterness of wormwood. Something that is such a delight on the surface, something that could even appear beautiful, is actually twisted into something that is bitter and perverted. Not only that, notice he says her her words, her life, it's like a sharp two-edged sword. Let, Let me just clear this up. There are all sorts of ways to use sharp implements. We use scissors. Doctors use scalpels to heal here. That is not what's being described. This is, make no bones about it, this is an instrument of war. It is meant, when it is thrust, it is meant to do damage. It is meant to take life. No matter how you touch it, no matter from what side, it brings death. And that's its intention. It's a two-edged sword. There are things that are can helpful, there are things that are good, but if they're not kept and used and appropriated in their rightful place, they will bring death. There's a couple of ways to have fire in your home. Yeah, I know you've thought about this. You should think about this. Your insurance company certainly does. One way to have fire in your home is on a thing called a stove, right? Or possibly in a, a, a wood burning oven or something like that, or even in a fireplace, right? Generally speaking, fire outside of those kinds of places is not good in your home, right? Because in one sense, it warms, it nourishes, it cooks food for you, it's helpful, it's life-giving and life-sustaining. Outside of those places, what happens? It burns everything down. That's what he's describing here. God is not anti-woman or anti-man or anti-relationships or fostering those kinds of things in a healthy, holy, dating relationship. He is absolutely committed to those things on his own terms. You must hold that kind of fire within the terms that he has set. Verse 5, it just gets worse. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. Note very carefully that the consequences are not merely temporal, they're eternal. We're going to see some temporal consequences in the next passages. We're going to see how uh, a man may lose his livelihood, lose his work, lose his marriage. I was talking with Tim Keeter before the service, the earlier service, and we were talking about how this passage has actually been taught numerous times here at Grace. Marriage seminars, men's conferences, like about four or five times these chapters have been taught in our church. Painfully so, I remember one such instance where a dear friend of mine who was like an older brother in ministry stood right here preaching this very passage, but only in time would he make a mess of his marriage. He would destroy his marriage, his children's lives, and his church. 
And not only did he go astray from what is being taught here, he went astray in, a, in an awful way and because of the nature of the affair that he carried on, it not only made local news in his church, it made international news. I'm very mindful that that was the last time someone preached this passage and stood right here. We must watch our life and doctrine closely. None of us are above that, and we must hold to the truths of God's Word. Why is that? Because look at verse 5, soberly. Her feet go down to death. It's not that she'll just lead you to make some bad decisions. It's not that you just might lose some money in the wager. It will kill you. It will kill you. This is a reference to judgment. Death and Sheol, these, these are words that are used in parallel here. They're, it's utter ruin and destruction. It's the place of the, of, dead, of the dead. It's the place of judgment, away from the presence of God. One writer says this, Little does the adulteress know that the party she throws is on the avenue leading to her destruction. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is undefiled for fornicators and adulterers. God will judge. We'll return to this point later in the chapter, but it should be obvious here at this point that you cannot flirt with sin and think that there will be no consequences. You may actually escape some of those things temporarily, but eternally that's not the case. And here's what's inter interesting. If, if that seems less weighty to you than losing some finances and a relationship, then that tells you what's in your heart. It's the fool who reads verse 5 and says, that may be true for some, but not for me. Solomon is already well established. That person's a fool. Why is this? Verse 6. Last verse, she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't know it. She nor her suitors truly ponder the path they're on. They cannot see out of the morass of what they have put themselves in, of their own destructive tendencies and ways. A number of years ago, there was a, a dear woman who was dropped off at the church in the middle of the night. It's a true story by her date that evening. There was no date at all. He dropped her out here. She spent the night on the playground. She knocked on the door the next morning and some of our ladies wonderfully ministered to her and cared for her and laid out all sorts of ways in which the church can come alongside her and help her and safety and provide for her and get her back on her feet and so many other things. And, and you know what she said after all of this? This is after hours of discussion and trying to help her and counsel her. She said, the money's just too good. She doesn't ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't even understand what she's dealing with. She doesn't know it. No thought for tomorrow. He's describing one here in verse 6 that her life is marked by constant turmoil, instability, the most devastating part on a human level. Into verse 6, she doesn't even realize it. She doesn't even know it. Surely you've seen what I've seen. We've tried to minister over the years in various ways to, to those who are struggling in these areas and in, in areas of great magnitude. You drive through this city or any city and you see women and sometimes men who are skeletons walking down the street with their eyes sunken in their head. They did not ponder the path of life. They had no idea that this is where it would end. They did not consider. No one pointed them. No one told them. Or they didn't believe. And we look at those kind of situations and we think, well, that's an extreme. It's not. It's not. How do we know that? Because Solomon, the wisest man in the world, is warning us of this very thing. Solomon understood this. Let me say this as, as we wrap up this particular section. These warnings that are here are not to scare us away from marriage. If you're thinking about marriage, contemplating marriage, and dating relationship on the horizon, you're trying to think about these things carefully, 
It's not to scare us from marriage or to become even overly critical of the opposite sex. That's not what is intended here. The warnings exist in Scripture in order to clear the path to see the goodness of God's design. Whatever our relationships may be, we need to remember, and this is really important, this is Christianity 101, that that other person in that relationship with you, that husband, that wife, that child, that friend, they are a sinner just like us. C.S. Lewis, kids, you might remember this, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. What, what does he call the, the children? He, he calls them sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. You know why? Because we take after them. And we are sinners just like them. Uh, in fact, C.S. Lewis was influenced in that by the Puritan writer John Oxenbridge, who reminded all who enter into marriage that you are about to marry a child of Adam. Good counsel. Marriage is not required of anyone, but those who have it must protect it. Those who don't have marriage must also respect it. Where marriage does exist, it is a mercy of God and a gift to be cherished. Where it doesn't exist, it is to be prayed for, sought biblically, thought through carefully with wisdom and leadership and instruction. Where it does exist, let us help one another, encourage one another, protect each other to see God's mercy in that. Another Puritan, you thought they were all repressed, Richard Baxter. He says, it is a mercy to have a faithful friend that loveth you entirely, to whom you open your mind and communicate your affairs. And it is a mercy to have so near a friend to be a helper to your soul and to stir up in you the grace of God. It's beautiful. Another Puritan, Daniel Rogers, he said, he says, what marriage is, is the interworkings of mercy and providence. How God, and at this point in the earth, over 8 billion times can take two people and bring them together in this way. Mercy and providence, he says, made their match, to which we say, God hath determined us, wife, out of this vast world, each for the other. It's like Humphrey Bogart. Out of all the places in the world, you walked into this one. Out of all the 8 billion plus and ever-growing people in the world, the Lord's design is He still has someone for you. Should that be your desire? Should you come to God on His terms with this? Ultimately, it's a reminder of our need for the gospel. I want you to hear this above everything else above all the noise of the culture, above all the confusion maybe that you've been taught over the years or you've heard in different ways, God is deeply merciful to those who turn to Him. God loves and knows how to meet your needs as a married person, maybe married to an unbeliever, maybe a single person who's struggling in different ways, maybe as a, as a widow. God knows how to meet needs. He knows how to restore broken marriages. He knows how to care for the brokenhearted. He knows how to rescue us from the messes that we make. How do we know that? It's right there for you to read. We also see that experientially in our, in our church, in our homes, in our lives, as we band together and we encourage one another in the body of Christ with the gospel of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless your word, that you would strengthen us, your church, by it. We pray that even now you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word for some things that are new and that they need to learn. For others, things that are reminders and refreshers, things that easily fall out of our purview and we don't always think about these things. Lord, but in all of these things, we pray that you would strengthen our hearts with your grace and your truth with the overwhelming love of the body of Christ, with the relationships that you are forming and have formed in this church, that they would be a testimony of the wonderful gospel and the good news of Jesus, that even marriage in its wonderful conception and in its design by God is a picture of Jesus' love for his church. So we pray for that. We pray for the marriages that are represented here, those that are on the front end, those that are many decades in the making. We pray for the lonely and the brokenhearted. 
We pray for those that are struggling in all variety of areas with purity or singleness or just navigating relationships. We pray, Lord, that you would strengthen hearts and that you would strengthen this church with one another through all of these things. Father, we pray that we would also be mindful of the wayward women and men of this world and that we would go to them in love and with grace, holding out the precious truths of your gospel. We pray that we would be a beacon of light to those who need to hear of Jesus, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Before you get away, I want to remind you of a couple of ministry um, opportunities, announcements. There is a youth retreat coming up in July. It's still a, a ways away, but the signups for that are going on now. That will be locally at the Vision Ministry. It's an overnight youth retreat, July 15th through 18th. There are signups for that. Uh, a detailed email has gone out. Uh, from the student ministries to the parents. But if you want more information on that, you can see the, the front desk uh, or Josh Elmore. He's around here somewhere. You can ask him about that. We also have April 14th, a congregational meeting. This will uh, discuss our last year and current uh, upcoming uh, budget proposal, uh, as well as an update on our building plans and installing Travis Payton as our next elder to join our current elders and leadership in our church. So we're excited for that. Uh, after that meeting, we'll have just a picnic on the grounds, come and fellowship with one another, bring your own dinner, and we'll enjoy that time together. Uh, lastly, we will have our next baptism class, April 21st. If you were part of our baptism service a few weeks ago, you know what a joyous experience that was. And just to hear testimony after testimony of God's grace in people's lives. If you're wanting more information about that, what does the Bible teach about baptism? What is it? What is it not? How do I get it? Why is it important? And all those kinds of things. Come to that class. You're not obligated to be baptized or anything like that. But if you want more information, uh, please sign up for that so we know how to prepare for that. You can do that at the front desk. All right. Let's stand together as we close in prayer or close with our benediction. This comes from Psalm 143. May these words ring in your ears today and this week. Let us hear your loving kindness in the morning, for we trust in you. Teach us the way in which we should walk, for to you we lift up our souls. And all God's people said, Amen. You're dismissed.